This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here, and as with so many recent weeks, this one has certainly been eventful. Starship Serial No. 8's flight has seen a number of delays, which more recently seems to have been largely related to approval processes. On top of all of this, there has been so much news outside Boca Chica with the new Cargo Dragon to complete the Commercial Resupply Service 21 mission. There are a lot of firsts in that one. We're going to talk a little about NASA's Break the Ice Lunar Challenge, and a few other interesting updates. Updates. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Now, last weekend we launched the video with all indications that Starship Serial Number 8 was going to take flight potentially on the Monday. Monday, of course, came and went with rumours of a static fire attempt instead, which also didn't happen. All eyes were then on Wednesday, which also came and went. At this point, most of us believed the delay was really due to the approval from the Federal Aviation Administration. Finally, of course, late that Wednesday we saw the FAA post pop up with the notice to airmen finally published. The exciting line there saying that the approval was given with the altitude ranging from the surface up to unlimited. More recently, a surprise change to the flight altitude, lowering it from 15 kilometers to 12.5 kilometers. I suspect SpaceX wanted to lower the maximum velocity a little and keep Starship within slightly thicker atmosphere. Provided weather and systems work out to be A-OK, -okay, the flight there is set and the excitement at this point was palpable. Everybody that could be there seemed to be on site. Tim Dodd was doing the rounds down there, Cooper Heim, and many more. The anticipation here, I think, was getting the best of everyone. On Wednesday night, we saw what appeared to be a final test of SN8, being a wet dress rehearsal test where the team went through all necessary milestones that would occur before a flight. The road was closed with the tank farm venting soon after. The propellant loading began, however, this time it was a different configuration. We saw the liquid oxygen tank get covered in a layer of frost, indicating that the tank was being filled and pressurized with liquid nitrogen. On the other hand, the methane tank was actually being filled with liquid oxygen oxygen. This was done as a safety measure to avoid an accidental mishap and an explosion before the flight. Soon after all of this, we sadly received a notice late Thursday that the flight would instead be pushed back into Monday. This schedule is changing almost daily at this point, so to get the latest news on when it is likely to fly, check the Cameron County website. What keeps appearing to be an imminent flight turns quite quickly. Now Declan here from Flight Club did give us a pretty awesome idea how the flight itself may play out. This is all very speculative, but based on the numbers that we have available. Showing here is the engines firing for around 41 seconds before engine cutoff. The flight would be totaling around 4 minutes and 15 seconds. Austin Meyer here got in touch as well to share his thoughts. As the author of X-Plane and the new free Starship simulator on the App Store, I can't think of many people more qualified to predict how this flight may play out. His thoughts are that Starship SN8 will cut engines after that initial burn, with the Starship then naturally flipping over like this before settling into its belly flop position. The link to the app is in the description if you'd like to tinker with that a little more yourself. You can also play with a full Mars entry as well. It's interesting to experience the flight profile yourself, so pretty cool stuff there. Thanks Austin. So in the lead up to all of this Starship launch schedule news, we saw the preparations for the flight where SN8 was being worked on continuously throughout the week. Over that time, the landing pad was of course being cleared of debris as well. Majestic sunrise footage here in the week captured by Mary and NASA spaceflight as we kick off the exploration around the sites. Spotted in one of RGV aerial photography's photos this week is what looks to be a part of a thrust puck for Super Heavy BN1. This plate, we believe, attaches to the dome and is used to mount the engines onto the vehicle. When looking closely at this plate, you can actually see eight mounting points for eight Raptor engines. Three months ago, remember, Elon actually said that Super Heavy will have 8 inner engines and 20 outer engines. Therefore, we can be pretty certain that this piece is indeed the beginning of BN1's thrust puck. Brendan has made a couple of renders of what this could possibly look like. This layout allows for the full 30 degrees of gimbal movement in each direction. Moreover, delivered this week was a new thrust puck for Starship along with some pipes. Could these pipes be some kind of start of the Super Heavy's downcomer? Let me know in the comments. Another interesting delivery this week as well with a new structure on a truck covered up with a tarp there. Now we didn't get to see much of what was under that tarp, but if you've got any ideas on what it might be, let us know in the comments as well. 
Mary, with her eagle eyes, spotted the SN14 leg skirt and SN15's middle liquid oxygen tank stack. Even more recently, a common dome for SN16 was rolled out of the tents and was flipped soon after. SN16. Just keep in mind that SpaceX are only about to fly SN8, so they've got eight more Starship builds in progress ahead of them now. Also, what we assume is SN10's nose cone was spotted inside one of the tents with the two flap attachment jigs. Those jigs are used to align the hinges, actuators and aero covers and are then removed before the actual flaps are attached. Starship Serial Number 9 continues much of the inner workings that are largely hidden from view. From top to bottom, the internals are all being prepared prior to its rollout to the launch pad. After the evaluations of SN8's flight, that may well be on the card soon. Within the engine bay, there are of course the small landing legs, just the same as SN8. We have of course been wondering how that debate was going about the Starship version 2 legs, and we did ask if they would be a similar flip-out style to the Falcon 9 as previously commented on by Elon Musk. Elon replied to us on this saying that Starship legs are one of the hardest problems. Externally mounted legs require shielding, which adds mass. A wider stance adds mass. Shock absorbers, of course, add mass. That said, we need better legs. So yes, not a lot of extra information there, but it does go on to show that this is no simple problem to solve, and they're obviously continuing to work on that. Later in the week, Eric created this render of the Starship with two deployable legs inside the skirt and two within the aft flaps. The idea seemed weird as even stated by Eric himself, but Elon responded saying not bad, so perhaps there are components here that could be worth further investigation. Work continues finalising that high bay as well, which is mostly just cosmetic stuff at this point. Also interesting is that SpaceX are finally making a move to dismantle the Mark 1 nose cone, which has been sitting here in the construction site for over a year now. So as we take a flight back over to the launch site this week, passing a few super heavy boosters there just for scale, we can check out the latest work going on with the new bunker style structure that is currently under construction at the orbital launch pad. We assume this will be used for observation while testing is underway with future Starship or Super Heavy prototypes. Now, some other recent news regarding Starship is that the Federal Aviation Administration announced that it is currently evaluating SpaceX's proposal to conduct new test operations and orbital launches of the Starship and Super Heavy launch vehicle at its Boca Chica launch site. Furthermore, SpaceX could test as many as 20 Starship prototypes at Boca Chica before it manufactures its final iteration of the spacecraft. The FAA will need to assess if SpaceX can continue its launch operations after that time at the Beach Village as it's near by a wildlife refuge and around 30 minutes away from the city. If SpaceX passes the evaluation for its plans, the company will remain on track to continue developing the launch vehicle at Boca Chica into the future. Now, big thank you as always to Boca Chica Gal with NASA Spaceflight. Just look at some of these incredible shots with SN8 there getting ready for its test flight. Beautiful stuff. Likewise, RGV aerial photography picking up so many shots with detail like this. There is no way that we could have spotted that new thrust puck ring out there without that aerial view. Just awesome. Speaking of awesome things, if you like this shirt, my good buddy Brendan working with me each week has this one up on his store. Link to that in the description below if you'd like to pick up one of these as a gift at the same time, supporting work of course on his diagrams. What all of these creators are doing allows so many of us to share it with you all around the world. Of course, without you right there watching, liking, commenting and subscribing, there would be no one to share it with. So thank you most of all to you for your support right there of this channel and all other channels that we follow so closely. So the upcoming Falcon 9 flight sending the commercial resupply service mission to the International Space Station is planned to launch very soon after this video goes live. So if it hasn't happened yet for you, set your reminders because this is going to be yet another first for SpaceX with a number of interesting components to this mission. We'll dive more into that in a moment, but first a big thank you to Skillshare for their support of today's video. Skillshare is an incredible service providing an online learning community with literally thousands of captivating classes for curious and creative people. It really does provide you with the ability to quickly deepen existing passions that you may already have, explore brand new skills, or just get lost in creativity. It offers membership with purpose, and with so much content to browse, you will accomplish real growth very rapidly. This isn't a whole bunch of theory and no practice. Skillshare offers classes designed for real life and all of the challenging circumstances that come with it. These lessons can help you stay motivated, inspired, and it also allows you to meet a community of millions. 
begins. Your interests may lie in website development, it could be animation or video production. The incredible work we present on this channel are terrific examples of what may interest you. When I first started getting into a little hobby photography with my first DSLR, I had no idea what I was doing. I just set everything on auto and just hoped for the best. This introductory photography class taught by photographer Justin Bridges would bypass a lot of the mistakes I made trying to understand it all. You will learn how to manually balance shutter speed, aperture and ISO to achieve those perfect exposures with the expertise you didn't realise that you had. Added tips here on some must have gear and recommended budgets will let you make better decisions when you upgrade your equipment as well. Skillshare is organised specifically for learning with no ads interrupting you. It's also incredibly affordable at less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. If you'd like to help support me and you'd like to give it a try, the first 1,000 people will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. Just follow the link in the description below. So yes, the commercial resupply service mission to the International Space Station due to launch very soon is going to be a real interesting one to watch right through to the docking at the station soon after. SpaceX's CRS-21 vessel will be the very first autonomous resupply mission using the new Dragon with the ability to dock by itself. Of course, SpaceX have flown many previous CRS missions before, but that was with the original cargo Dragon that needed to be berthed with the station by the Canadarm, which would grasp the Dragon capsule and slowly pull it in to the docking port. The new version of Cargo Dragon is much more closely related to the Crew Dragon we have witnessed with several milestones this year, including that in-flight abort test, the first Crew Demo 2 mission with Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley, and the much more recent Crew 1 mission that is docked right now to the station. That is up there docked to the forward port of the Harmony module for quite some time until its return planned for May in 2021. Other benefits to the new Cargo Dragon versus the old are the solar cells that are built right into the trunk instead of the deployable solar arrays. The nose cone also opens up and closes instead of simply being discarded and wasted like it was on the version 1 Dragon. What is very exciting to me is that CRS-21 will actually be docking here right beside Crew 1's Resilience Dragon on pressurized mating adapter number 3. I really can't wait to see these two SpaceX Dragon vessels docked to the International Space Station at the same time. This is a great milestone right there. Now, this booster dubbed B1058 will be launching CRS-21 as its fourth flight. It flew that same Demo-2 mission with Bob and Doug, it was used with the Anasys-2 mission, and also a fairly recent Starlink launch from October 6th, just two months ago. Another very fast turnaround on this booster. Cargo Dragon version 2 also has only two fins, whereas the crew version has four. That is interesting in itself. I believe it's due to the abort systems not being used in the cargo version. Super Dracos I don't believe exist in this version either, and the four fins on the crew version essentially help to provide that extra drag needed in an abort situation. With no abort system, the extra two fins are just extra mass for no reason. The main difference, of course, is the design of the interior. There's no need for crew seats, screens, or any of that stuff. The cargo version is decked out primarily with racks dividing up all of that cargo space. Speaking of the cargo for this mission, the most exciting, I think, is the Bishop airlock, which will be a permanent commercial component for the space station itself. It's going to provide payload storage and satellite deployment systems as we see here. At times, it can be detached to simply serve as an outside toolbox for crew that are on space. Spacewalks. The airlock built by NanoRax has this awesome bell jar design that gives it a lot of capability to help expand the flexibility of the space station. Seen here is the process for that installation. It'll be sitting here in the unpressurized cargo area there. The cannon arm will then extract the airlock and install it onto the station. From here, crew inside can work to place various satellites on board or any other useful cargo. Again, the airlock can be sealed and undocked to deploy the satellites easily as we see here. The external payload installation options will be extremely useful as well. Anything that adds the capability to assist with a spacewalk is a very great thing. Now the pressurized capsule itself is going to be hauling a huge amount of supplies as well as research material and experiments. One in particular that I think is interesting is the research tools that will be demonstrating blood analysis in space. All very worthwhile projects and I can't wait to see CRS-21 dock over the coming days. 
Now with all of the excitement leading up to human moon exploration, it has been extremely exciting to see the enthusiasm ramp up even further with announcements such as NASA's Break the Ice Lunar Challenge. Landing ourselves on the moon after all of this time is really the first small step to setting up a sustainable and constantly crewed presence on the moon, a goal that I think is so wonderfully inspiring. Having a research site on the moon is going to be a lot harder, at least in the initial phases of the program. In order to live there sustainably, we need habitats, water, fuel, and all of the infrastructure needed to be as self-sufficient as possible. It's extremely expensive right now to send mass to orbit. To send mass to the surface of the moon is a completely different story. The goal of SpaceX's Starship, of course, is to dramatically reduce that cost, but regardless, it is just not practical to bring everything along. We need to utilize the already existing and very valuable resources that the moon has to offer to aid us on the way to a new era in space travel. The moon's regolith should certainly be able to be used to create buildings and building material if we can find the right way to utilize it. Water contains what we need to fuel spacecraft with liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. Imagine having refilling stations scattered in key areas on the moon. That would allow ships to simply do a suborbital hop from one location to another, refill and hop again. There are a massive number of challenges, so let's not pretend that this stuff is going to happen anytime in the near future. A single rotation of the moon takes 28 Earth days. That lunar nighttime at 354 hours is a harsh environment to deal with. Almost 15 days without sunlight and the temperature at this time drops dramatically to as low as negative 170 degrees Celsius. Solar energy alone is not going to cut it. Of course, in lunar day, temperatures can head upwards towards 100 degrees Celsius. That alone is a very difficult situation to deal with. Likewise, low gravity creates a lot of challenges as well. Tech that works here on Earth is just not going to be up to the task. That is, of course, where NASA's Break the Ice Lunar Challenge is providing incentives to industry, small businesses and students to come up with some great concepts to address many of these challenges. As a stepping stone to technology that can be used on Mars, I can't think of a better way to begin our evolution to truly become a multi-planet species. There is a lot more information on the several phases of challenges linked in the description, so check that out if you want to know more about that. Now a very quick update on Rocket Lab's recovery of the booster from the return to sender launch. The team retrieved the booster, checked it out, and has already determined that it has come back in such good condition that Rocket Lab should be able to re-qualify and refly some of the components. The next attempt will be in early 2021. There is no mention of a helicopter catch for the next one, so it will more than likely be another ocean retrieval. So yes, terrific news there and a huge milestone achievement towards making Electron partially reusable. Keep an eye out on the website for further updates as they become available. The link to that is also in the description. Now finally today, some sadder news as I'm sure you've already heard. The Arecibo radio telescope collapsed entirely after a number of previous issues that saw the telescope heading towards disaster. Now previously two cables had failed which made it too unsafe to even have workers attempt a repair. It didn't last much longer than that though with the structure completely collapsing early in the week. When it comes to detecting asteroids and planetary defense systems, this is just a massive loss. There was really no other installation like it. Twitter, of course, erupted with images being shared of this disaster. It seems like the last straw for this telescope was potentially triggered by a small earthquake, adding just that little bit too much stress to the remaining cables. We can see from where the main structure impacted that one cable snapped first, allowing the full load to swing down, breaking the remaining cables as it smashed into the side of the dish. Now, there are already petitions starting wanting to have it rebuilt. However, signs for that are really not that good, and even if it does occur, in any way in the future at this location, that is a very long road ahead. For such an iconic structure, it is super sad to see this happen. Now, a big thank you to every one of my amazing patrons listed here. There is no way that we can continue creating content at this level without you all. Your support helps a massive amount. Thank you to each and every one of you. As support increases, that helps the whole team. So if you like what we're doing and you'd like to join our awesome patrons, head to patreon.com slash Marcus House. That gives you access to interact with me more directly via the linked roles on our Discord server. You can have earlier access to the videos to watch before anyone else. And you might also like to be listed right here, like all of 
of these other amazing people. It means a great deal. A massive thank you as well to the production team helping out as always. If you're interested in these topics and you'd like to be a part of this, please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my video last week talking about Rocket Lab's booster recovery, Falcon 9's Sentinel-6 and Starlink missions, along with the Starship updates, of course. In the top right is my latest video, and in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from my channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching, and we'll see you all in the next video.